Perfect. Here we are. It is episode 191 of the Mosh Pit. We were just dip, uh, drilling through some of the details here, but as you know, in Mosh Pit fashion, uh, we'll have a bit of, of play, it, play it off the cuff as well, I'm sure. With that said, um, excited to bring everyone here. Want to draw your attention to what we do in the Mosh Pit and a few things that you can expect. Uh, this is a global gathering. We have Mosh Pit tribe members join us each and every Friday. My cohort, uh, compadre, I should say, David Gray and myself and the tribe from the EU, from Canada, from Mexico, uh, from Asia from time to time. We bring everyone here because we're looking to get outside of the U.S. mindset. The U.S. centric mindset is one as it relates to workplace which is what we discuss from many different aspects of workplace, whether it be um, sanitization of the workplace, that was early on, hundreds of episodes ago, all the way to uh, complex discussions about ESG today, metaverse, applied anthropology, everything in between. With that said, beyond it being just global in nature, we're looking at getting outside of the usual suspects. So you'll find um, the, the real estate broker here, you'll find the architect, the workplace strategist, the CRE professional of, of, um, of, of many years, but you also have your applied anthropologist here. You also have your clinicians, IO psychologists, um, org design professionals. Uh, we, we try to get outside of the usual suspects, bring in people that have seen the challenges that are being faced in commercial real estate and workplace and just broaden our set of tools. Uh, there's something that's delivered in the mosh pit. I don't want you to be surprised. It's called the people's elbow. It's always delivered with love, Dr. Whitney. If someone has a disagreement with what's being shared or a pers uh, an alternative view, we welcome that in the pit and we discuss it and we chop it up. It's always delivered though with love. So keep that in mind. Um, also, I want to draw your attention to the chat because our tribe members are very experienced. We're talking PhDs. We're talking, um, you know, well-tenured uh, executives. We're talking authors, and they always have content in the chat, whether it be discussions, resources, so forth, so on. So I want to encourage you to save that chat afterwards, and you'll want to review those things um, at your at your convenience. With that said, Mr. Gray, did I leave anything of material out? It, nothing. You you hit the salient points like you like you always do, and you you pointed out that we have a hundred ninety this is the hundred ninety first episode. So excited about today. Get to that in a second. The other one ninety that we've already had have been truncated down to four to seven minute videos. In the old days, we went on for twenty two minutes when we had six PhDs. Couldn't chop it below seventeen. Our, our then video team said it's impossible to edit this down further. Looked at all the metrics. People, you have the attention span of about two minutes, okay? So we, we, we try to truncate these videos down. And Jamal, I think that's going way down with uh, you know TikToks pointing at 55 seconds and 20 seconds, et cetera. So, but we, you know, we, there's just too much. We have to squeeze in a lot of content. So it's four or five minutes. And when I've, I see some very talkative people that will jump in later after our, uh, our two SMEs uh, kick us off talking about ESG goals and, uh, well, with it, diversity, equity, inclusion together being an equation, making the real experience happen in the workplace. Whatever the workplace is, I don't know anymore. Jamal, last week, Andy Lake kicked off his book, Working Beyond Hybrid. Next week, Gen Z is in the house. Gen Z is ask a question on the Mosh Pit's behalf to 11,000 people in their the reservoir. They, there's a, uh, a, a company that's the, the global leader in studying just that generation. Not as young as Dr. Whitney's three and a half year old, who is an alpha. That's the next thing that's going to be coming up. In fact, hopefully, uh, you know, he'll crash in here, that three and a half year old later interrupt uh, mom and say, hey, you know, I've got things to say. So I'm going to learn about alpha uh, too. That is great. Here we are. I don't. I, I I don't have time to go into the bio, so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Whitney Austin Gray and uh, Genera to talk a little bit about them themselves on a personal level, just to kind of you know get the room engaged. 
who would like to go first? Whitney, well, why don't you take it away? <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Whitney Austin Gray. Um, my full-time gig is leading research at the International Well-Building Institute. I'm a bit of a design groupie because I follow designers around and try to translate public health research into practice. Uh, I also teach at Georgetown mostly so that I can hope to selfishly inspire the next generation to care about health in urban planning and design. Um, I'm just I'm excited to, to learn from you all. Let's see. Um, on a personal level, I like toddler cuddles. And I like tennis <laughs> and chocolate and wine, preferably together. All right, over to you, Janera. With the toddler cuddling me, if I can get it all at the same time, that'd be great. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, so my name's Janera Sorrell. I am with IWBI as well. I'm in the market development department, um, responsible primarily for our real estate clients. So I work with all the large real estate um, owners that you may think of, but also um, work with um, the Latin American market. So I'm I'm focused on Latin America and real estate. And on a personal note, I have a 10 year old who I think is still also a generation alpha, if I am correct. And um, he's, of course, delightful. And uh, so he takes up most of my free time. And we just went skiing, which he can barrel down any mountain. And I love it when he goes faster. Um, and things I love, um, skiing is one of them, of course. I'm from the Caribbean, so I also like to be really warm. I love that. That's a great intro. And now, either of you, kick us off. Tell us what we're talking about today in the pit. Yeah, so we, we've, uh, we have a little bit of a strategy. So Whitney's going to kick us off, and then um, I'll take over a little bit later. Perfect. So everyone, we're going to give you a little bit of intro. So our question will come probably in about 10 minutes time. So but we first want to sort of go through an exercise with you, because today we're going to be talking about ESG goals and DEI and how that supports the user experience. And that is Genera's lead. I want to introduce this, though, by talking about the well equity rating. There is a lot of discussion about DEI. There's a lot of ideas about DEI. We, we are in it. We are absolutely in it. And we're in a mosh pit. So there we go. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about this concept around inclusion by design that's part of the well equity rating. So I want to start with some storytelling, if I can, which is the well equity rating has 43 different features. But I'd like to introduce you to a couple of my friends here. So the first feature that I want to talk about is offering child care support. And I'm going to tell you what this feature does. And as I do that, I'd like you to picture who you think this feature is for. So this feature provides working parents and caregivers uh, care for their children. This can be through on-site daycare, backup daycare, love this one. This is for the winter breaks, the holiday breaks, even emergency uh, care, for example, when they're, when they're sick and you need to work. And we'll actually even look at certain discounts and support systems um, within the workplace to do that. We also have policies to support flexible work for parents. All right, so who is this feature for in the workplace? Who guessed my friend here, Rick? So this feature is for everyone, of course, is the answer, but many people were likely picturing a woman in this and likely a younger woman. Um, in this, and it might even be a woman of color in this. So we just kind of want to think about um, that this actual feature is for everyone. My, my husband loves this slide, right? Speaking about how these policies do support everyone. Um, the next feature I want to talk about is our educational support feature. So this provides financial support um, for education and or mentoring opportunities to support career advancement and financial stability. We do this through tuition assistance and mentorship programs on site. So who is this feature for? Who are you picturing? Are you picturing someone young? I was picturing like veterans and seniors who are maybe wanting to reskill themselves a bit. Awesome. Yeah. So we oftentimes though, we'll sort of rely on this idea that someone younger is seeking out education right? Or we might see that that's maybe someone in a certain field or discipline. Uh, all right. The third feature I want to share with you is um, providing restorative spaces. This is actually one of my favorite features. 
So what we do in this feature is we require that environments encourage restoration, and we actually want to see a policy to take that operational. So don't just build the room. We actually need to see that people are allowed to use it, right? This is the classic example of the CEO that never uses the gym on site and then wonders why the room is empty. So we have requirements for this room. It needs to address adjustable lighting, sound interventions, thermal control, seating arrangements, subdued colors, and visual privacy. One of the reasons I love this feature is that we're hearing a lot about how return to office cultures mean that I actually no longer have my um, pressure release valve to turn off. In other words, when we were at home and we were too tired, too stressed, um, you know, we went through a difficult situation, we could just step out. We could turn the pressure valve off. We could just have a minute to close my eyes, to get some food. Uh, we see in a lot of research coming back on particularly the survey for workplace arrangements and attitudes, that's global. When we look at preferences for work from home, a big one is this access to nature. Not down 10 stories, not through the lobby, not 15 minutes later, just 30 seconds outside. And what I would posit is you're seeing that people need a space to recover, to let down. This is also very important when we look at a neurodiverse population. Um, and in this situation, like an ADHD person where we're saying, you know, there are situations where you might feel overstimulated or understimulated. So if I say, who is this feature for? Who do you picture? You don't have to answer. It's just sort of a, a brain exercise. So this is a black CEO as a woman. And in this situation, we don't associate neurodiversity and ADHD with CEOs or the black woman as a CEO. So it's a trifecta, right? And what's interesting about this is actually there's been a lot of research in the last several decades that said having ADHD made me a better CEO, right? But often it was because you had to face challenges to get through versus creating environments that actually support people. And the best analogy that I can give you on this, which is my favorite, is that we focus so much on the person, the employee, or the um, seed, if you will. So we give them education and training and professional development and resources and more education, more training. And then we take this beautiful seed, human, and we shove them into the concrete crack of, <laughs> of a city sidewalk. We don't water them. We don't give them light. We don't give them air. And we think somehow that seed is going to turn into a flourishing plant and a forest eventually. Many of those seeds that did survive in that crack of the concrete um, basically were very, very resilient, but did that in despite of the environmental conditions. So if you can create conditions to allow the seed to thrive, if you can focus on these environments and you can do so for everyone, then actually you benefit the entire population. So I just shared with you three features. There's 43 different strategies in the well equity rating, and each one of them has a story such as the one that I shared with you. But what I want to drive home is when we talk about DEI, when we talk about the well equity rating, is that oftentimes people will say, um, you're designing for them. You're not designing for me. That's someone else's issue. That's someone else's background. That doesn't apply. And I really want to encourage us to think about this as a strategy that actually is about designing and being strategic for everyone. And my quick example here that I want to turn to is the anthropometric curve. I don't know if folks are familiar with this. This is used within design to look at spaces and products and basically say, in order to create a fighter, uh, uh, I was going to say a fighter plane, so for a fighter pilot, um, I have to understand that the majority of the population will be able to fit in the cockpit, but 5% on either tail of my bell curve will not fit. I cannot create this for a 300 pound individual who's seven feet tall. So we're all going to agree that we can't create a cockpit uh, for a fighter pilot if they have those, those dimensions, right? However, there's actually a lot to learn when you start looking at the extremes of the bell curve. So my posit, what I posit here is you're actually, when you design for the extremes, when you look at those situations that we've pushed to the tail end of the bell curve, you're actually benefiting the means. Another example here I have is a chair company, furniture manufacturer, and everyone in blue is going to be on the 
tail end of the bell curve. You don't fit in what the majority is going to be for this chair. In the well building standard and the well equity rating, we're actually going to design furniture with flexibility to meet everyone. But what again, I wanna encourage is that if you think that this equity rating is for them and not for you, if you think there's not something to be learned about studying different individuals and backgrounds that benefit you, I'd like to welcome and introduce a conversation that equity is for all. And so there's so many examples within design that when we design for the extreme, we benefit the means. We're not going to get into today, but just to throw some out for you, the curb cut that you use for your suitcase or for your stroller was actually designed for wheelchairs. Designed for the extremes, benefit the means. Your garage door opener was designed for those who were disabled and couldn't get out of the car. It benefits everyone. Um, if you're in a luxury, if a luxury um, bathroom and you have no lip to your shower and you walk in, guess who that was designed for? Those in wheelchairs and those with physical disabilities, right? And now it's become something that actually benefits everyone. Uh, for those of you over 55, you have a high chance of cataracts. So if I can provide task lighting for the extremes, if you will, in the situation, we actually find the majority of the population prefers a task light to control and not overhead beaming lights that cause migraines, for example. Um, so these examples are endless. And so that's really the way I want to introduce the well equity rating is it is for all. And there's a lot to learn about studying these, if you will, extremes that aren't always the norm, but there's so much history and data and understanding about how we can actually create places for all. Uh, so we welcome you to this journey. It is a journey. When it comes to DEI and equity issues, we're not going to solve it overnight. We welcome you to go down this path with us to make us better in this conversation. So I'm going to basically turn it over and we're going to open this up to conversation, but just so everyone is super grounded, uh, the well equity rating is part of the well building standard. It, uh, we had over 200 concept and well equity advisors that helped to inform the rating. You can use it on any project. You can use it on a retrofit or a new building. You can use it when the building is constructed because you're looking at policy, for example, or if it's a new build, you can look at some of the design principles. You choose from the 43 and you select out the 21 to pass. Very excited that um, Elena is with us today and I don't actually know if your picture is on this slide as it should be, but really thrilled that you were part of these advisories and really look forward to having you offer some narrative context about that experience. Uh, it was a multi-year experience to try to harness people's knowledge, understanding of how do we put forward a standard around equity. If you'd like to learn more, I'm going to just give you a short plug for the Well Forum. That's where all this conversation is going to go so you can learn all the details. Uh, the key themes about the well equity rating are listed on the right. And you can see a list of um, companies that have already signed up and stepped in to pursuing the well equity rating. So with that, we're going to turn it over for our first discussion question. Uh, and so I think maybe I'll introduce this and turn it over to Janera to add for their yeah, content. Okay. My question for you is, do you feel that your company's DEI strategy if they have one and if you're knowledgeable of it or lack thereof, do you feel like it includes you? Janera, over to you. Oh, I just wanted to put the link for the Well Forum in the chat so that everybody can uh, feel free to browse and peruse it. So yeah, so this is actually a question for you. Do you feel that um, you're included and that equity uh, measures in your company are for you? I mean, it was really funny, Whitney and I were talking right before and I was telling her that I sort of like fit into so many categories when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion. First, I'm an immigrant, I'm a woman of color and I'm a primary caregiver, both of elderly and uh, aging parent and of a young child, but I don't feel like it speaks to me. And um, so that's kind of strange, right? I mean, you would think that I would feel that it really speaks to me. And then when Whitney was just saying about putting a seed in a, in a concrete crack. That's actually how I went about it because I just like have been um, doing it on my own whilst maybe it would have been much easier and simpler and, and less, uh, less of a, a challenge if I had had a lot of these wonderful strategies that could have supported 
my own growth and development throughout these years. So what did, what do you guys think? Does it feel like it's for you? I find that interesting. I'm, I, and anyone chime in, you don't even need to raise your hand at this point in time, unless I guess you're off camera, we wouldn't see you. Um, but I am interesting. It's, it's very fascinating to me, Janera, that it does not seem like it fits for you, given all the categories of protected class that you fall into. And yet, I don't believe many of them fit for me either. So it's just, that's very, why is that? Does that have to do with designing for the mean instead of the extreme or the individual? How does everyone else feel? I can start calling on names if you like, Amanda. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it, depend it depends. I mean, if you're just talking about DEI from a perspective of all of the things that they they offer, um, like we have a lot of ERGs and I, you know, I appreciate some of these uh, well-designed uh, principles, but they don't necessarily have things for women of a certain age. <laughs> so I would say that they don't always include, um, for, they wouldn't say it's necessarily for me. I appreciate that. Just like I, I appreciated um, Dr. Whitney's um, perspective on education assistance or support for those that aren't necessarily just out of undergrad or um, also with regards to support with caregiving for family members and those that have older ones. So with that said, uh, Catherine, what's on your mind? Well, uh, I, I love this and um, having had young children in the 90s and early 2000s, these some of these things just sound um, almost fairy tale come true. Um, but what I wanted to ask was, this really refers to employees, does it not? And I know that there's a very large trend. I'm based in Silicon Valley um, for people, a, a lot of contingent work hiring contract workers and how, how does this concept affect people who often do not have the full status as employees um, and how do companies respond to that sort of differential so um you're asking whether it's just for companies I no i'm asking if it's just for people who are full-time employees or actual employees and not contingent workers. So in, in Silicon Valley, there's a, a huge population in companies who are contingent workers. And for instance, I worked in a company as a contingent worker for a period of time. And um, we had a different um, signature or a different signal on our badges. Mm. That was one. Were you a blue badge or a red badge? Mm. Number one. Number two, if you were, I can't remember which was which, but if you're a full-time employee, you were allowed to, to have a, a Mac, a, Apple Mac as a computer. If you weren't, you got something that looked like it was off the assembly line in China somewhere. So, I mean, there was a, there were all these little ways that they were differentiating assets, differentiating access to meetings. So I'm wondering in this this whole concept that you're talking about. But many of many people spend full days, full time inside, say, a corporate office. But when you're talking about these this well rating, how do companies perceive their um, how they are supporting these? Um, this wellness rating or well rating um, if they have different classes of employees? Well, I mean, the, we've created the rating such that it can be really flexible. Remember that Whitney said they're like so over 40 and you need to only comply with like 20. So it it depends, right? So if, if, we, if the company has full-time employees and um, consultants, they can decide to do it, to apply this, the features and standards to 
both groups, but it's up to them to do, to make that distinction. I see. I don't know if we tell them that they must do it across the board for everybody. Um, ideally, they would if that's their ethos as a as a corporate culture. Um, but it, like the example you give, it that doesn't sound like that's what they were doing. But we also see besides for corporations, we also see asset owners, like property owners implementing the well equity rating for their tenants, meaning for the common areas and for the, the sort of more um, the spaces that they manage and their own building um, building managers, like their building staff. And then we see the equity rating being implemented in residential buildings as well, where those property owners make sure that the people that are living there get access to all the different kinds of um, strategies and features that they can provide, making sure that everybody feels welcome. So it's we've designed it to be very flexible to um, make sure that different way different applications are possible. I don't know if you want to add anything. Sure. So, I mean, realistically, the anthropometric curve, right? 100% accessible for 100% of people all the time is not realistic, right? So the idea that there is contract workers that do not have access to the full host of benefits that a company offers is, is absolutely an issue. So we are now seeing with some of the research that you can't pay me more to keep me, but you can offer a better environment. In fact, I'm actually willing to decrease my salary if you give me certain benefits, right? The benefit is more important to me than money. And this varies across different generations. So in that situation, Catherine, like I'm a new mom. If I was nursing, the idea that you have no amenities for me to do that means I'm not coming into the workplace, right? That's a really significant issue. So in that case, they're actually using the well equity rating well, equity rating to promote that this amenity is accessible. So we see it used, now you can flip that, right? So you can use benefits from a hierarchical perspective to make people feel excluded, which of course is ironic. But the idea is only those that are full-time employees get access to my company's benefits because I want to showcase how great I am. And of course, in doing so, it excludes those that are not part of the company or not full-time workers. Um, so I think the idea is that it's written for all, how it is interpreted as your full part-time employee is varies across different features. So, um, having a bathroom that has a changing table, um, means that it's accessible for all on site. So Catherine, how is, how is that exactly defined? Right? So we're going to basically say businesses, we want you to take that first step. We're going to offer some language and we're going to encourage you to think through these scenarios. We want you to survey. We want you to have a plan. If 90% of your workforce is, you know, contractual or part-time, you're not really, why are you going to go for this unless you're going to represent that population? Will I see um, violations of this? Will I see people taking it to the extreme where benefits become a hierarchical advantage, therefore disadvantaging those that don't have access? Yes. I anticipate that that will happen. And historically, that has happened for sure. Um, I did a lot of work actually studying environmental services because in healthcare design, it's so critical for life and death situations for terminal cleans. Different topic, not for today, but when we talk about excluding and not thinking through everyone in the workforce, in the end, people die because they're not trained and educated and the cleaning practices is such that we actually led to massive issues and liability for the hospital. So sometimes that business case also is critical in this. So it's a great question and I absolutely think it's out there and I want to see the best and I'm prepared for the worst. Yeah, Jim. So thank you for your presentation. Um, so DEI um, is being de-emphasized. So does that mean the well equity rating is coming down because it's being de-emphasized? Well, what we're seeing is, I'm, I'm assuming, Jim, that you're referring to the politics in this country. Um, Correct. <laughs> what we're seeing is that our clients are not not doing it. They're just not naming it such, right? So when certain clients are already engaged in, in practices and policies that create more equitable 
um, places of belonging for their people, whether it's their tenants or their employees, they're not going to all of a sudden suddenly change their policies. They might not say that they're doing it. They might not call it the same things because of the political backlash, but there's their um, programs haven't shifted. Um, and then we're seeing like, and then others are doubling down. Like I was just on the call with um, the Empire State Realty Trust, ESRT. They, they're they very proud to announce, and they will very soon, um, And but it's already public, that they've achieved the equity rating across their entire portfolio. So if you go into the Empire State Building, it has the um, equity rating. So, um, and the same for Veris, which is a, a multifamily uh, asset owner in New Jersey. They are also very, very proud of having achieved the equity rating across all their buildings. So, you know, Maybe, but not really. Whitney, do you want to add anything? Oh, were you saying something, Jim? Um, no, she she hit the nail on the head. That you know, it is politics, and uh, um, you know, and it's getting a lot of press. But you know, it's good to hear that uh, they're ignoring the press. Well, it's not ignoring. It's just like they're just they're definitely not ignoring the press. They're using different words. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're moving forward. They're not saying DEI, ESG as much as they used to, but um, they're still doing what they, their corporate culture um, and strategy has sort of like led them to. And that's actually a bit of what I wanted to pick up on because um, jargon goes in and out of style, right? And and I definitely have created sustainability strategies that don't have the word sustainability. And I think what's really for me, powerful about the well is it's what equity does, not necessarily what it says, right, Jim? So today it's DEI, tomorrow it's something else. I'm not a native English speaker, so every language is going to have, you know, its jargon. And I um, I think that's kind of how I look at it and what I really appreciate it with the health equity rating coming out is because it, it kind of creates a definition, right? So whatever you mean by DEI, what does it actually look like in your spaces? And then you can call it pigeons for all we care. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not speaking for IWBI, but my my work in this was very much like, this is what it actually looks like. And that's the other comment that I wanted to make about this designing for the mean. I've been really interested in that for a long time, in part because of the, all of that research, and you mentioned the, the cockpit research, but also uniforms, right? So military uniforms over the years were created for an average person, right? And how that was done is what's the average hips, the average height, the average waist, totally fine. But when you actually put them together, that person doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? So if you just do the average, no, it fits nobody, right? And I think this is what's interesting, right? Jamal and Amanda, when you're like, it doesn't really feel like it's for me. I wonder if that is why we always feel a bit excluded, right? Because that average person who doesn't have any of these concerns and doesn't have neurodivergence, doesn't have this, doesn't have that, isn't nursing a baby. And that, that individual doesn't actually exist. And so kind of creating that common denominator actually means that pretty much everybody does not feel at home. And, 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 and the flip side is, you know, these features and pushing us to actually go, hey, and I remember kind of in the process, one of the issues that one of the working subgroups I was on is kind of for non-biological parents, right? Because the truth is that, you know, like I'm a non-biological mom and what that meant um, is that in a lot of places, I didn't know how to fit that around. Because if you are a bio mom and you're nursing, if you're lucky, which of course is a huge big exception, at least you have a nursing room. But for parents who are just juggling, which means dads, which means sometimes grandparents raising kids, there is no permission, social permission for you to actually step out and go somewhere and attend to the kid that you're caring for, right? So yeah, it's kind of, I think for me, the big thing here is stepping away from this idea of average, right? And actually going like, what is the greatest range of people that can feel like they belong, that can feel um, that they have a chance and a pathway to, to health and well-being? And that's a big switch from this, like to designing for the, designing for the mean. That was my experience. That's what we're doing, right, Whitney? We're designing for the extremes. Yeah. And I, I'll be, I mean, there's a question coming up here. Like I will be direct is that our, um, well, equity rating doesn't sell the same way that our other ratings do. No, but it is selling. But it not is well. selling, but not the same way. So thank you. Uh, Janera's on sales. So 
I'm always the optimist. Like, you know. but there are, there are hard questions. I raised them with my CEO, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you're fighting a good fight, but do building professionals feel comfortable talking about policies around DEI? I think many people on this line are workplace strategists or sort of in that space in between working on the real estate, the corporate real estate side, and then also working on the employee base side. And I often look at that we create programs, we put out data, and we don't think about the person that actually has to be the interpreter of that to their company and whether or not they feel comfortable. And I can stand on stage all day long and talk about health super. I mean, I love it. I jam on it. It's my background. But I sit there often on stage talking about sustainability. And that still feels overwhelming to me. That's not what I was formally trained in. I'm the first to say I'm not an expert, but also if you don't step up and into it, will it be spoken about in the same stage as health? Probably not. So I just, I also want to kind of elevate that we've put it out there. That doesn't mean people feel comfortable leading it. And it's interesting who stepped up and in. And I think that just acknowledging that just because we created this program, people have a lot of feelings in the last couple of years if they've felt literally included in DEI or excluded by this sort of ironic process of creating a program for certain people feeling like they're not part of it. And so the reason we start off this presentation talking about that is to just like acknowledge I think that's in the mix. And I really like Elena's comments that, you know, to Jim's point, ESG was coined in 2005 by Guilford. He was a PhD student. It existed in this premise before, it will after, it will change names. The term well, as in the well building standard, do you want to know how that is interpreted in multiple countries of this world? Japan doesn't even have a word for wellness. Um, issues around equity in China as part of this rating were significant. So not only are these words going to change and evolve, but when they are weighted, we need to be thinking and pivoting to different terminology and also being thoughtful of our global audience, which is already having to process and try to translate some of these concepts. So therefore, the process and concept is more important than the label or name, which actually is pretty awesome because we're talking about DEI. So maybe I'll, I'll end on that note. <laughs> Sarah, yeah, did you have something there? Oh, but yep. you'd think I'd learned by now. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is that we have to remember that the vast majority of companies don't actually care very much about how the employees feel day to day. I mean, some do, but we're coming from an industrial model that I mean, I'm an anthropologist by training. I care a lot about organizational culture. Let's be real though. We're coming from an industrial model that is about humans as replaceable widget makers. And we're in a paradigm shift, which could take a hundred years. I mean, it's just, the reality is yes, this kind of work of centering humans and centering humans, particularly mar when you center the most marginalized humans or the humans that haven't been centered in the story, you're going to take care of everyone, you know, and that's great um, and necessary work. Uh, but it's, it's a hard sell because it's still a nice to have. And the only play that is really attended to here is one of retention or attraction in terms of recruiting new employees. So in 2020, when we were dealing with great resignation and a lot of churn in the marketplace in 2021, we saw a lot of attention pay paid to well-being. Now, if you've noticed, even positions focused on well-being have disappeared as well because it's not there's no imperative right now for that. And you're seeing actually the flip side, which is a return to command and control and mandates. So, you know, like your work is really important. You're definitely pushing a boulder up a hill. I think everyone in this forum probably is in the work that they're doing, even in terms of workspace design, centering actual humans in design and build, pro you know, in actual architecture and design projects, like humans haven't always been considered fully, uh, you know, even from that standpoint these versus like the pure aesthetics of the space. So incredibly important work, but yeah, I can imagine um, 
it's a hard sell and and it's it's going to be the companies that are the most progressive and most interested in making a positive impact and maybe decentering a pure profit motive or seeing this as an avenue towards creativity and innovation which it is so anyway and that's also we have on. investors who who cherish this right so we're seeing where you know, for example, again, ESRT, they, they are a REIT, but they have a CEO who really cares about this. And so he can drive a lot of these um, these corporate decisions. So there needs to be buy-in from leadership for sure, uh, but not only because they think it's a good thing, but because they think it is a, there's an ROI that's a positive ROI. And you're right. It's going to take a certain selection of CEO leadership who actually believes that. Yeah, and some people really do. Yeah, absolutely, some people do. I might segue us, so thank you for those points. Um, I don't think it'll take that long, though. I have great faith, and for any of you who have been in the sustainability movement, and we were in those first rooms in 2003, remember that comment, how long it would take? And now there's an architect in the world that doesn't know what lead is, and frankly, even more now what well is, that is increasing. So, you know, the awareness and change and education is there, you know, and it's starting to move, but, you know, points are well taken. And so I think this is a good point, good time to transition to the levers in the market. So you can convince people, you know, to do health and well-being, pay more to get more, or you can ask them, are you even getting what you originally paid for? Or are you at risk because you know, you could pay for this and without paying for it, you're actually non-compliant. So that's an interesting issue within regulation. Another lever is where do you get the money to begin with and how do we plan to regulate that? So I want to shift the conversation a bit to what we're doing with well to sort of move that mark to shift the understanding around health and well-being. And I'm excited as um, someone that's been in this space my entire career um, is that as we moved into the pandemic, we had 500 million square feet. And we are officially out of the pandemic. So uh, that actually only happened last year in 2023 that we officially ended. And as of this year, we're at over 5 billion that's in our portfolio. So we see this shift up. Now we're going through times of an intense constraint in the market. So we will see how this shift will actually land. Um, but one of the things that we're really closely looking at is how do you get money to do the good work that you're doing? How do you make the business case? How do you, to Sarah's point, counter some of these notions that health is nice to have, just like sustainability, nice to have, and DEI, nice to have. Um, and so one of the ways that we do that is looking at some of these levers around companies reporting their materiality. Um, that's done through corporate social responsibility reports. That's single materiality. So that is to your shareholders. You must demonstrate what you were doing and how you were doing it based on what is of the most value to running your company. Double materiality is going to say, wait a minute, what are you doing for your company? And what are you doing for your employees? Uh, and we're even going to go further. What are you doing for the community? So there's this conversation that company, if you're publicly traded, you have a corporate social responsibility report. Within that, you need to demonstrate what is material. Within that, you need to demonstrate how you're going to test, track, and manage what is material. Lots of ifs there, right? And ESG is going to play a really critical role inside of that CSR report because you're going to use ESG as a benchmark to demonstrate that you're meeting these materiality goals. I will say before anyone asks, because this is the reality of it, there are so many different uh, ways to measure ESG. And I hope that I'm not the only person that thinks it's a little bit odd. They don't come up with the same number in the end. So there is a reason they come up with their own proprietary scoring and tracking. There are issues year to year. And we know from the construct validity of how it's measured. Those are all up for grab. But I will tell you when you're securing money, I must demonstrate why and how you secure money and what you're doing to your shareholders and stakeholders, ESG is at play. And we want to leverage what our companies are doing for health and equity as part of this larger narrative of materiality. So I will turn it over to Genera and then we'll pivot to asking another question here that starts to pull in more of that ESG conversation. Thank you so much, Whitney. So as, as Whitney was saying, we, we look at these other frameworks, these third-party frameworks as the ones that you see on our screen. And how do we 
connect to them. So for example, the UN SDGs, many of our corporate clients are also reporting to the UN SDGs. We are about 80% aligned with the features in the UN SDGs, specifically, of course, the ones related to health. Um, so that helps with, um, with achieving, again, what Whitney was saying, their corporate social responsibility goals, because they may make a commitment to the UN SDGs before they even come to us. But then when they realize that implementing well will help them achieve their, their sustainability goals, their global sustainability goals. That's one of the reasons why they get engaged. A second one is what you see is GRES, which is uh, about 40% aligned, which is more for asset owners. Um, so GRES is now not only measuring environmental sustainability, but also um, social sustainability. And we're, we've partnered with them um, to help them measure what that, first of all, define what it means and then help them measure. So for our asset owner clients, they, who are always continuously trying to improve their GRASP scores, not only is the, is the environmental component important, but now that the social component is becoming increasingly more weighted within the GRASP um, framework, that's going to be more important as well. And why do they care? because the investors are looking at it, right? So if you think of a pyramid for investors, it's like if at, at the top are, are the investors themselves, like the pension funds or even high net worth individuals um, or funds, you know, asset managers, then at the, the next level are the, are the sort of more general funds. And, and then at the lowest level are the asset owners. So how does the, the guy at the top understand that, that these buildings are really performing according to what they say they were going to do. So in order to avoid greenwashing, there all these measurements have to come into play as well. So we provide a framework and a way to measure what's been um, what's been implemented. But we don't do it ourselves. I mean, we we provide the framework and then the measurement has to happen by the clients and then the the evidence that's supported or is to to their claims will be verified by third parties. So. This is how we're making sure that what people say they're doing is actually what they're doing. Next slide with me, please. And then um, for our at scale clients, which are the clients that are working with us across their organization. So for example, JP Morgan, Clifford Chance, um, I think GSK, there's like a whole, all different kinds of uh, industries work with us on an and, but also asset owners like ESRT, I just mentioned already, they work with us on an at scale level, which means that they can um, implement all of our solutions. So we have the certifications, which is our first one that you're probably most familiar with, which is an asset by asset full certification. It's kind of um, our gold standard, if you will. It takes a long time. It's difficult. It needs performance verification on site. Then we have the ratings of which the equity rating is one of them. And we already went into depth on that. And then we have two more ratings, which are the health safety rating, which are more um, facilities management and operations rating. And then the performance rating, which is for smart buildings. So if you remember Whitney's growth curve during the pandemic, we launched the health safety rating with that. Um, I don't know whether you saw that ad campaign with Lady Gaga and Robert De Niro, which was really um, a good way to communicate to the end user, to the consumer, why, why it's important to have healthy spaces. So that was like the first impetus of that hockey stick growth. Now the growth is continuing because of those ESG solutions that I mentioned just now. So for our at scale clients, we have all these different awards. You can go on our website and check out the leaderboard, but we see which of the companies are leading the pack and they care. They really care. So yes, it's going to take time. And, you know, maybe we're working with the ones that are ahead of everybody else, but I don't think that it's going to take a hundred years. So how can we measure DEI strategies as part of ESG? This is a question that we pose to you guys. We, we know, and I just sort of explained how we do it. Um, we have a framework which is measurable and holds people accountable. It also is a, a roadmap. So with the equity rating, for example, you need to achieve a minimum, but then the minimum is less than half of the total number of features. And then there's a lot of other things that you could do over time. So you can improve over time. But what is it that you guys are doing to measure the, if you even 
implement the AI strategies. I can quickly volunteer something that I'm actually chewing on in case anybody wants to offline discuss some details. So working with an industry association that actually is in a unique position to influence industry-wide DEI. However, of course, it seems like we can do better than just measure how many women and Black people and Asian people. And, you know, it really can become so simplistic, right, to go, like you said, uh, Genera, how many, how many boxes do you tick in somebody's DEI strategy and can be quite dehumanizing. So keen to actually measure where power and money sits within the real estate sector of the Bay, um, of the Bay Area, right? And see if we can find meaningful metrics to go, are we shifting that? So historically, we know it's set with intergenerational wealth and you looked like much older white men held the power and the money, right? So if meaningful, we want the the power and money to be distributed in a way that represents the diversity of the community. What are the indicators and how do we get there? So that's what we're trying to measure, but there's not really ready data. So anybody offline that has suggestions or has data sources uh, for how to begin to measure that, it's an opportunity to potentially really influence the real estate industry. I, I love that, Elena. I think that's wonderful. I've I have this sort of scenario in my head I talk about where it depicts a little bit of what happens around DEI strategy. So I sort of feel like, you know, you can picture a Cornette conference here. David, I'm sure you can picture this. And on the main stage, there's a huge party happening. In fact, there's free booze. Everyone is partying. And they make this sort of announcement like um, the DEI session is being held. Uh, it's hallway Z. It's about a 15 minute walk. And then you get there and there's like three black women on the panel and there's a room full of people that already get it. And we're all talking to each other. And I say this because the room next to it five years ago was health. And the room 10, 15 years ago was sustainability. And it was always hallway Z. And it was always when something else more fun was happening. And as a result of it, we go there. And I said that if I walk into a room that is titled DEI at a conference, and I have the same type of person that is on stage. And there is not literally a diversity of people on the panel. It's like walking into a room, we're looking at women's health issues, and there's no man in the room. That we probably are talking to each other. And the hardest part of this is talking to people that are not in agreement, that don't feel included and don't think it's important. Um, that is why I showed a middle-aged white man on my first slide, right? To be a cue that this conversation needs to be a little different than what we've had it in the past. So I will tell you those rooms, and I'm being critical here, the DEI room that has the three black women on the panel, next to it, the health room has everyone that's perfect weight that works out every single day and drinks green juice. And then the sustainability room has a whole bunch of people that drive Volvos and, you know, have PVCs in their house. And so when we start seeing this shift, it's the fact that we are, by our nature, not being inclusive to the people that have gas guzzling SUVs that care about the planet or that are working on obesity issues but care about health more than anyone. And the people of the DEI that feel that they're not being represented and so I think, Elena, it's an excellent point that needs to be brought up over and over and over again. Where is the money? Who has it? One of the mm -hmm. things that I was tracking in this return to office was the sort of middle, well, mid 40s. We're not going to call that middle age because we're going to live to over 100. So we'll just kind of say what that is. I, I've changed in our, my in our youth. I've gotten older. Yeah. But anyway, so we saw this sort of 40 year old male, 40s to 50s, a white male that wanted to return to the office. And we said, if we give you money to have a four-day work week or to have a, a hybrid work week, and this is according to the Survey of Workplace Attitudes and Performances globally, they would say at this age, I'm not taking it. I would rather make my salary and go to the office five days a week. Now, why is that? There's a lot of reasons, um, but one of the things that was coming up was that I liked going into the office and having my oftentimes wife or partner take care of the children. And now when I'm at home, I'm supposed to do that too. That's really hard. That's a very real issue. You know, so when we think about this stuff, it's like, 
yeah, we're changing norms. It's uncomfortable. You know, I said everything I said, and it's it's probably a little elbow in there too, because I do want to go into a room where everyone loves health, but we're not going to make the difference until we go into a room where people are struggling and want to feel part of it. And until we're not in hallway Z and we're on the main stage next to the bar. Yeah. So since hands have not come up um, yet on this answer, what I wanted to maybe do is what about shaming? That's a question maybe I have for the both of you, because what tends to happen, and I've been at the beginning of multiple movements now and sustainability and health and blockchain and you name it. And what tends to happen when finally we have language for this, right, is that we create an us and them. And so these people in the healthy room or these people in the equity room, they actually can be we can be our own worst enemy, right? Because we get on our moral high horse and we're like, well, see, now this is real and all you don't get it. And that also doesn't help changing and bridging, you know, bridging the gaps and, and building the bridges and that sort of thing, right? So I guess if, if that feels relevant um, to you, maybe we've been, how are you experiencing us moving forward and finally feeling heard, right? For all of the communities that have been underlooked without having that judgment, that shaming, that us and them that actually can preclude us from going forward together. That's, That's a really good question. Question. I also see that Brian has raised his hands. So I don't know if yeah. he wants to add in there too. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, we can. Okay. Good to see you again, Dr. Whitney. I don't know if you remember from TD days, but that's a long time ago. And it was when you were pushing lead back in the day. I'm going to say pushing lead because that was in <laughs> the early 2000s. <laughs> oh, um, God. How am I still 25? That's so weird. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm actually struggling to answer this question because fundamentally, I don't know how Rogers particularly actually measures DEI within our ESG framework. Um, I, I I have read the report. I know that we have looked at our ESG reporting and the framework um, aligned with the UNG or the United Nations. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the acronym, but it, it is based SDG. on those SDGs. Yes, thank you. So, um, and within that, there's a particular focus on um, diversity. Uh, and there's, a, am gonna say a, a huge number of groups that cater to different colors, different cultures, different religions within Rogers that help create inclusion. So, and I know everybody's doing that uh, and there's a lot of people who approach it from that perspective, but in terms of how do we actually measure it, that's a tough one. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm gonna hazard to guess that no one does it well. Um, and, um, and, and maybe we could do better. The other aspect that Rogers that we do is with respect to truth and reconciliation is, is really acknowledging um, those spaces. And in fact, I know we just won a coordinate award in Canada for the ones that we're doing across the country to at least acknowledge that part of um, the, the damage to society and culture that, that we collectively have done. Um, but I don't, I don't know that I'm versed well enough uh, to understand how we're doing it. Um, I'm trying to make and connect the dots um, and how our Cree team specifically can work more collaboratively with our technology and our facilities and operations teams to really measure the impact of our workplaces relative to operational costs and our carbon footprint. But aside from that, I don't know that I can speak well or eloquently about what we're doing. Okay, so two great threads up, back to shaming in a second, and then this one that Brian came to on who measures well. And I, I know uh, Janera and Whitney are going to have some great responses. I'm doing Jamal's role right now because he usually he'd be, within the last two minutes, he would unmike and say, you're welcome to stay here as long as you like. Apparently, we heard from Mr. Gray and myself that we're we're cutting at the top of the hour, we're moving on, but we're, everyone who stays in this room, we'll stop the recording, but uh, finish some of these uh, uh, open threads. And with that, I want everybody in their hearts, if their video camera isn't on, to, to do a golf clap uh, for well showing up, just vibrantly opening up a lot of threads and more to get to. Thank you very much, you guys. Dynamite. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you, Whitney, for all your context. I love it. Great stuff. Okay, uh, so I'm going to, but I'm giving the mic to 
uh, to both of you from well to say, okay, two threads up. We, the mosh pit does not look the other way when the threads come up. Who measures well? I, I'm not sure who measures well. I bet a lot of people do. And I think it's slowly getting better is sort of what I, I picked up on. And then second, uh, Elena wanted to go uh, in her, her Russian fashion of, of, of tossing a couple of elbows at the same time on shaming. So I'll let you two handle that and then come to Jose and then boom, recording off. Whitney, why don't you take measuring? Because you're, you're the data expert. Uh, so what I would point you to, um, and thank you so much, Brian, great to connect with you again virtually, is that if you look at CBRE's report on sustainability under the E of ESG in 2008, uh, you will see the way that they report on sustainability is all words. Flash forward 15 years, 2021, how do they report on the E and sustainability? All numbers. So the way that we start this dialogue is talking about the initiative. So Brian, you're probably in your ESG report or your CSR report going to see some mention of an effort, some community building effort, right? Some DEI effort. And you'll see them strain to try to find how do we describe this? The goal is to get from words to numbers. The really important part of that is the SEC is going to say, Hey, everyone that tried to use words before to describe your non-scientifically valid measures in ESG, we're holding you to account. So right now we are in words, right? We're seeing a lot of DEI reported in words. Um, to the discussion today, maybe it shouldn't even be reported as DEI. I'd like to see it just reported as part of the systematic goals for the company in the first two pages of the CSR in the CEO's report. I wanted to say we're about investing in people. And we don't have to call it out as a checkbox. In fact, I worry that if it is, it'll be on page 80 of your report. But I would encourage us that in this conversation of words, well is going to give you numbers and they're scientifically valid. Once you know what scientifically valid measures are, you're not doing them. So once someone sets the bar, everyone has to rise to it. Whether you choose to do it or not, whether you're aware of it or not, if you're the best at what you do, you know it exists, right? So I think it's a very powerful time to go from, you know, words to numbers. I think there are numbers out there that we're going to start to set the bar for. But Brian, they're not enforced right now. They're not regulated. And the SEC is not largely looking at this at this point in time. So you get ahead, you get behind. But I think the best companies, if you ask me, are already internally tracking and figuring out how to externally report. And that's like a, uh, the tension point right now because you don't have to be required to externally report. But I do think a lot of opportunity um, there. So thank you for, for being honest and elevating that because I think that is where the majority of people are is where do we report it? How do we even talk about this? And where do we go from there? So I think you represent a lot of people in, in that sentiment. Yeah, and to build on to what Whitney said, there are research reports out there and I'm just putting the link in the chat and actually Whitney, Whitney has one that's a 10 year long longitudinal study of well-certified buildings. So there is our, there are ROI studies out there, not written by us. The, the, what I just put in there is a, a research review of 60 independent studies, including one by MIT where they show that there is a, a, an ROI, a return on investment on investing in health, right? And so these numbers, of course, you know, they, I don't know how they work. I, I don't know the methodology behind it, but they, they're co they come from reputable institutions. So we have to just believe that, that they um, have some substance. Um, and then over time, as more and more companies and buildings and systems get, um, aligned with the definition, first of all, of social sustainability, if we don't want to call it health or well-being, um, what's the definition? How do you, and then how do you measure it over time? We will get to a more robust um, framework of measurement. And then when it comes to shaming, to go back to Elena, um, yeah, that's a good one. I hadn't really thought about that, but I think that, you know, it's always, there's always like a little group 
that what are they called the liminal cells, Whitney, that change and then they 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 are the ones that start creating the change that then becomes um, a more a broader um, movement. So maybe in the beginning there is some shaming because we're we, we feel so so proud of all the effort that we've put in place to get to this level of you know if we're thinking about health and well-being to be healthy to move enough to eat well to meditate like all the different ingredients like and then we know that there's effort associated with being healthy right so if there's a whole bunch of other people who are not putting in the effort um yeah. we know that there's they're not putting in the effort. I think I would add that I would never would want to approach this, honestly, by shame. You will see a defensive posture and you'll see a rebellion. So how has this one worked for anyone on the call? You should diet. According to the American Public Health Association, you should not have certain fatty foods. You also should stop smoking, drinking, or doing anything fun in your life. Um, we've now given you all the information you need and you should feel shamed um, to the point where sometimes in my work, I'll talk about health and people will like come up to me and be like, I ate McDonald's. And I'm like, I don't need to know that. Like, if it makes you happy, like you go do you, right? And there is this dynamic and shame doesn't work long term. I think no. to Janera's point, it can compel attention. But remember diets, the main word in diet is die. How many diet books are there? Tens of thousands. Why? Because there's that many that work. So, you know, be, I'm very, very thoughtful when it comes to change in health, when people feel shame, when they feel like we know better than you, when they feel overwhelmed, they are in a defensive posture. And at best you'll see them sort of say, yeah, I'll pick up a uh, dry January. I'm up to it. You know, I'm going to cut out, you know, fast food for a month. And that's why you see everyone revert back. Right. So how we message and empower people around these very sensitive issues is not something that I want to see dry January fix or one diet book. You know, I want to see a very welcomed conversation. So here, just because I'm, I'm on my riff here, salads, one of my greatest suggestions ever. They take forever to eat. And if you just put them with like every single meal, don't take away the thing that you love. Just eat a whole bunch more salad. And so this mentality, although you might be sort of laughing, actually is an additive mentality. I'm not telling you to not do it. I'm not telling you give up and I'm not shaming you for the thing you love. I'm just saying you might try to add this. Mick Cornett out of Oklahoma City, very successful in turning around his city with this type of mentality around driving down obesity. Don't punish me. Don't make me feel bad. Don't shame me because you'll get the sort of opposite. So from a health perspective and the research behind the behavioral science side of it, I think I can add that. When it comes to DEI, I think we're in even more sensitive territory in some ways. And so I think you can provoke, engage, welcome, and add some salad to the conversation um, without making people feel like they've got to give up their favorite thing, their favorite meal, or the thing that they, you know, they don't want to really look at or talk about that is, you know, really true to them. And so there's a lot of discomfort. Um, and I appreciate you raising the issue, Elena, because I do. I fear that people use that mechanism and it will set us back. Um, by the way, how long have we known about obesity? It's a pandemic. Americans, we spread it. Um, have we cured it? No. So got some more work to do. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I did post um, the link to the Rogers report. And okay. what I was trying to say is that the, the energy ones, I think, are much more mature and established, and there's a lot more policies that are coming downstream about, you know, net zero or reducing your carbon footprint and whatnot. The DEI ones are a little bit uh, trickier to measure, I, I think, at least. I, I'm not sure what the tangible measurements are for DEI strategies, um, and everybody has a different spin to it, right? Um, but um, I, I think we've got a good start in the report that links to the UN Sustainable Goals and SBTI, which I know was poo-pooed at the last uh, mosh, mosh pit, uh, David, uh, by, uh, um, uh, um, but I mean, you gotta start somewhere. 
we can criticize as BTI or the UN sustainable goals, but then let, let's not, you know, I hate somebody coming into a fight, throwing out, you, you know, the, their criticism and then walking away. If you're going to stand up for something, stand up and argue your point and let's agree to make it better as opposed to just saying this doesn't work and just take a hike. Um, so um, I, I'm interested in continuing to work with the the teams within Rogers to further our ESG goals, but you know DEI and DEIB now are such a big topic um, that there's more that we can do uh, within the workplace. To to your point, Doctor Doctor Gray, to really open up and uh, provide spaces for everybody that are much more inclusive, rather than you know taking the building code approach of let's do um, MVP solution that you know mm -hmm. kind of support some, but not everybody.